Meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, sehr herzlich willkommen zu einem weiteren spannenden Abend des Schweizerischen Instituts für Auslandforschung an der Universität Zürich. A very warm welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to all of you in the name of the Swiss Institute for International Studies. I wish you all an exciting evening. A special welcome goes to our speaker, the eminent virologist and Professor Ilaria Capua, as well as to my friend, Professor Felix Gutzwiller, former member of the Swiss Parliament and Professor for Preventive Medicine at Zurich University. The topic, as you all know, is given. Professor Capua is one of the foremost scientists to explore and define bacteria and viruses and their environment. Therefore, she is predestined to talk and comment of what we can probably label the single most enormous pandemic since the outbreak of the Spanish flu in the year of 1918. As we are holding this conference right now and the following discussion, we still do not know all too much about the new virus, its formation, its so-called logic, and of course also how to fight it effectively, hopefully more effectively in the months to come than since its surprising outbreak at the end of the year 2019. The virus, ladies and gentlemen, is one thing. Another is the global health system and its impacts for many forms of living and lives on planet Earth, not to speak of biodiversity. Professor Capua does not limit her thoughts and activities to fight, for instance, corona and its mechanisms. She goes a big step further to rethink the conditions and establish a health system of global dimensions. This enlarged system could help us not only to understand the prerequisite between sickness and health, but also to improve our many and complicated interactions with nature. COVID then could hopefully show that a big shock, as it was and is, and its substantial casualties might also have a positive impact to open doors for a better understanding of what it means to lead a sustainable life, not against, but with the laws and conditions of nature. Just a few words about our speaker's biography. Ilaria Capua was born in Rome, the eternal city, the most beautiful city in the world, probably, but Currently, she is a professor and director of the One Health Center of Excellence at Florida University. From 2012 to 2016, she was a member of the Italian parliament and focused on bringing together in a more efficient way science and politics when dealing with infections. Professor Capua's newest book is called Circular Health. Circular Health, that is the key word for our evening too. After an introductory conference of about 25 minutes by Professor Capua, Professor Felix Gutzwiller and myself will discuss with our guest here on stage for about 15 minutes and then as you know, as always, you have the possibility to ask your questions by using the chat function of your screen. This evening is supported by the Sanitas Insurance Sanitas Foundation. Many thanks for this sustainable support and return on investment. And now, Signora Professoressa, the floor is yours. We are honored and highly eager to look forward. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
Thank you for, for having me. It's the first time I speak after so many months. I speak in front of an audience. It's the first time. So thank you. And thank you for being, for being so perseverant because it is truly an honor to be here to talk about circular health um, with CF and with my uh, Swiss guests. So I need a pointer, which obviously in Switzerland is always in the right place. And I will start my, my lecture talking to you about a peculiarity of pathogens. Pathogens uh, can cause very, very big changes. And um, a mathematician at the University of Bath actually did a very curious calculation. He tried to figure out how much space the coronaviruses that are circulating now in the world at one given time, how much space this would be. And it would be less than a normal can. And so I think that with COVID-19, we have realized how vulnerable we can be to something that is so invisible and so dangerous. Pandemics are not a story of the last 20 years. Pandemics have been around for a long time, and some of them are transformational events. They transform society. Here is a, 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 an image of uh, what was the plague of Justinian, which was a terrible plague that turned around completely that society of the time. This means that before pandemics, there will be a before and an after. Exactly like we, when we talk about the war, we say this happened after the war. Pandemics are not wars, but they are uh, moments in which things have to change. Some systems will suffer and some of them will collapse. And we need to keep this well in mind. But mostly so, we are one of the species that are inhabiting the planet. We need to learn from this, from this catastrophe, and we need to move on in a different way. So as we talk about pandemic viruses and, and pandemics in general, uh, these pathogens either have a reservoir in animals or have a viral ancestor in animals, just to remind us that we are in the box with animals. And if we look at the major um, pandemics that we have experienced, uh, the plague has its reservoir in rats. Um, influenza has its reservoir in birds and in pigs. Spanish flu had an avian flu component in it. And HIV came from monkeys. And so it is natural that we get infected from pathogens that are um, momentarily in another species because you have to look at this through time. I mentioned the Justinian plague. The Justinian plague, it, we think, killed up to 100 million people in 541, and it affected all the known um, areas of civilization through boats because there were rats on the boats and people were moving around. And it transformed, as I said, the society of the time. But what is the rat of COVID? It's not a rat, it's a bat. It's a bat. Uh, bats uh, are, uh, there's very, very many species of bats. Bat is a big word. And some of these bats are known to carry viruses that can spread to people. But unfortunately, this bat met with a pangolin. And they should have really never met because viruses that were in the bat population and that most likely were in the pangolin population um, uh, found a way to create a hybrid virus. And this hybrid virus had the capacity of infecting another animal species, Homo sapiens. But in this, in this environment, where did this happen? This happened in a live, bird in a live animal market. Live animal markets have lots of other animals. They have animals that should not be together. They have predators and prey that are in one cage next to another. 
And there is also another animal which is, which is wearing a t-shirt and is touching those bats. And that animal got infected with the virus and was the beginning of worldwide spread. But let me tell you another thing. This happened in 2019, and it has probably happened in the past. But if it happened 100 years ago, it would have spread with camels. Like, camels don't go very far. I mean, they do, but it takes them a long time. And instead, what happened was it happened at the ripe of the globalized environment. And so we put it on planes, and the virus does what the virus does. It spreads. And so, you know, as we think of this, of this emergence that, uh, that has affected the whole world, one of the questions that I continue to get back is, but is it behaving in the same way? In the same way? And you know what? It's not. The answer is no. It is behaving in very different ways. And this is difficult to understand. And there are reasons why this, this infection is behaving in different ways, because it acts under certain conditions. Vi the virus behaves as a virus, but the severity of the disease is most likely to the host, is most likely linked to the host that will be infected with that virus. This virus can be lethal, it can be very contagious, it can cause asymptomatic disease, it can cause long COVID, can cause enormous surges in mortality and much, much more. And so we need to understand that it can have a series of ramifications. These little microscopic jelly balls can have gigantic and are having gigantic ramifications. And I would like to share with my audience here some of these ramifications, because this is not a problem only for the biomedical community. We have seen that only a couple of months after the implementation of the lockdown, uh, pollution in some parts of the world uh, was reduced. So this is a disease that can influence the level of pollution. Wow. But there is more. We have had a major change, I would say, halt of international travel, mainly by air. I personally, actually, CF had to, I think, book 500 flights for me to get, me because it, to get here because it was impossible to get from the United States to Europe, to Switzerland. I mean, it's crazy. We were living on planes. We were living on planes. I actually met my husband in a plane. Not on a plane, in an airport. So, yeah, it was part of our life. This disease has raped, I would say, some cities. It has caused um, disruption of entire cities, of healthcare, of transportation, of mobility, of, of, of schooling, of, of our social interactions. This is uh, a distance pilgrimage at the Hajj. We can't go to church anymore. We can't pray anymore together. We can't rejoice. We can't sing. We cannot sing. And then it has um, transformed our relationship with the pangolin. I wanted to let you know that there was a pangolin day before COVID-19. So this problem about the pangolin has been around for a while. The pangolin is one of the most endangered species in the world. You know why? Because they, they use the scales of the pangolin. And these animals are killed in thousands. And we cannot do this anymore. We cannot continue to destroy biodiversity. And there's many, many reasons why we shouldn't be doing this. And we need to start thinking in a different way. We need to respect biodiversity. This pandemic has caused the biggest economic crisis, I think, that the world has faced. Um, I, I, it has touched every sector of the economy and is um, requiring immense uh, resources 
to, to uh, I would say, develop into what's next. And, it, it, and that's why it's shaking systems. It's shaking systems because it has influenced the economy. And suddenly we realize, hey, but if we are, if we are sick, we can't work. And, 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 you know, we can't make our society function. And we had never thought that we would have been so vulnerable to something that is so invisible and actually even originates on the other side of the world. And then there is this. And this I want to talk to you and I want to um, challenge you on this because this is extremely important and now is the time. So let's say that, um, especially in the United States and in the UK, they say every cloud has a silver lining and I think that it's true. But I think that if we, if we look well and if we focus this cloud has more, it has a rainbow, it has a rainbow within. We only need to be able to identify that rainbow and try and want to get closer to it. So I think that um, as a species, we have realized that our health is interconnected with that of other species and that we are part of the system, okay? So like, we are in charge because let's say that we have some capabilities that are different from those of other animals. Um, we have the keys more or less to the system, but we are part of that system. We cannot destroy that system. We cannot insult it. We cannot, we cannot encroach into our own system and, and destroy it. And here is the opportunity. We are all aware that we are using more resources than we are entitled to. And therefore, we need to move towards the sustainable development goals. And now is the time, though, to look at how we can make health more central to our uh, desires. And we can try respecting these interconnections to co-advance the health of humans, animals, plants and the environment, because it's actually one system. And we can maybe even optimize and rationalize our resources. And there's something else that's happening. There is more. We are living in an open present. The present is changing. Open science is here. Disciplines are open. And as they become more open, they become transparent. And if they become transparent, you know what? They're not silos anymore because you can see inside them. And if they're not silos anymore, maybe we can think of them in a different way and we can rearrange them in a different model, in a circular model. Because we can get these disciplines to converge, to converge towards circular health. And so, you know, when, when, I, when I give these talks, they, I, they ask me, okay, so what do you want to do? It, it's, it's logical, so what do you want to do? How, what can we do? Well, um, I have a few ideas. I have an idea for a problem that we must address and that comes from the past. I have an idea for the future, and I have an idea for now. So we will look at problems that were a big problem before the pandemic. And I am sure that all of you know about antimicrobial resistance. Antimicrobial resistance means super bugs, super bacteria, or super viruses actually, in fact, that have been exposed to so many drugs, so many treatments that they become resistant. And if you look at this picture, in 2014, 2015, there was um, a large effort to really try and do something for antimicrobial resistance because it, it was projected that it would, it would cause more deaths than, than any other disease that we know of. And so, you know what? It hasn't gone away, antimicrobial resistance. And you know what it, it comes from? Well, it comes from overusing antibiotics. And so I might throw something in there for you. Do you think that we have over, 
we have used maybe more antibiotics during COVID? Are we seeing more hospital infections uh, by multi-resistant bacteria? Are we seeing less because we are washing our hands more and hygiene has gone up? We're going to have to look at this. We're going to have to look at how people dispose of these drugs, how the veterinary community and the animal health community uses antimicrobials, how they go into the system in water. In some parts of the world, they use anti antibiotics on plants, on trees for bacterial diseases of, of, of fruit. And, and, this is, and this is not good. And especially what is not good is because it is all interconnected, because we are linked to the animals around us, they, we are linked to what we eat, to what we drink, to our pets even. We need to find a way to foster integration and convergence across disciplines, across sectors, and across countries. We cannot have countries that don't speak to each other on these problems, because I think that it's quite clear that pathogens can move from one place to another. And what about the future? The future, I think, could lie, uh, could, could have many, many uh, surprises, good surprises, if we are brave enough. And I think that we have seen the incredible power of vaccination. We have seen in the United Kingdom, we have seen in, in the United States, we are now seeing in other European countries, as the vaccine hits the ground, the number of people who, who get infected, who die and who are hospitalized, collapses. Vaccines work. But because we really hadn't figured out that we were going to need this amount of vaccines, and let's say that we hadn't really, we weren't really prepared to produce such volumes of vaccine, we have a problem with equity. We do. We do have a problem with equity. And I think that we cannot ignore this problem anymore. Um, we need to empower um, the whole world to have access to vaccines. But can you believe it that one of the bottlenecks to uh, having vaccines uh, everywhere in the world is that in 2021, we are still uh, rely, reliant on the, on the cold chain to deliver and store vaccines we need to put vaccines on planes that are refrigerated and we need to deliver them to, to by, by, by truck and then by car and then take them to the most remote places at very low temperatures. And you know what this results in? That in many parts of the world, they don't even have electricity. Not only they don't have freezers. And so both for human diseases, but also for animal diseases, this is how we respect the cold chain in some parts of the world. And so don't you think it would be time now to think out of the box and to say, hey, but maybe we can develop a technology which does not require all of this cold chain, because it's not only keeping them cool, it's also preventing them from freezing, because vaccines suffer if they are not stored at optimal temperature, even if the temperature is too low. And this, uh, I, I found on, on the Gavi website, it, it shows that many, many countries do not have uh, functional refrigeration systems to deliver vaccine. And so maybe we could work on optimizing the delivery and these refrigeration, uh, we could get rid of refrigeration and imagine a world in which we could have vaccines that are stored at room temperature and could be put in the post, delivered in, in the mail, so you don't need to go somewhere, but the vaccine comes to you. It could be useful for diseases of humans, of animals. It would actually, it would actually, if we got more people vaccinated around the world, it would contribute to reducing antimicrobial resistance. 
It would certainly reduce the burden of preventable disease world, worldwide. And because we would be using less electricity, we would also have a lower carbon footprint. And maybe we can start in this way, getting our head around how we are going to address equity. And here are my last words. Here are my last words, and I want to really um, make a call from here, an open call. We are in the present. We want to fix this. We need to fix this. We need to understand, because in the future, we must prevent, we must not cure. We need to understand the full effects of this emergency on, on, on society. And so, um, just in case it wasn't clear and maybe somebody missed it, but women uh, are different from men. And it's not only biomedical differences, because there are some biomedical differences that are actually most probably reflected in medical costs. But we know that women are more compliant with certain regulations. We know that women can influence the behavior of others. Look at women bringing kids to get vaccinated. Look at what has happened with women losing jobs. In Italy, this has been a very severe problem. And look at the burden of the pandemic. Where is the burden on the pandemic? I have, look, I am sure that you all agree with me that we really need to look at this for women, but for men also, because we, we, we are different. And, and, and to improve, we need to work towards understanding this diversity. My suggestion is very easy. Easy. We want sex and gender data now. We work on data sets for research that are not always disaggregated by sex and gender, and public data, data that we buy from companies because we need to study the trends of this disease. We need to study how the disease moves. We need to study the, the mobility patterns of people, of family, of women. It is not fair that you get the data and it's not already disaggregated. Why doesn't this come by default for all the data that we need to study, to look at um, post-pandemic resilience? This would be easy, and I think that this would be time. So this brings me to my last slide, which is um, uh, about my, my book. I wrote a book before the pandemic about uh, a more circular approach to health. And I think that um, we can all recognize that health uh, should maybe, th the borders of health should be broadened and we should look at more than one species. We should look at the balance. Um, but I think that big data can offer, I know, it, it is difficult, it is complicated. The data are what they are, and they are uh, not interoperable at times, but what are we going to do, do without them? Are we going to pretend that we don't have them? COVID-19 is the most measured event in human history. It is. And so we can't waste it. We need to work on it, we need to work on it as a community, and we need to work on it to make this planet more sustainable and to leave this planet in better conditions for the next generation. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ilaria, for this fantastic conference. You have a holistic approach to the topic, to the problem. You have a vision. And I think we have to discuss it a little bit further because it has many aspects, also political aspects, social aspects. Of course, the scientific aspect, you explained where it came from, what's the impact, and we 
already knew it is a dangerous virus and it will remain a dangerous virus. But I mean, the best thing about this uh, menaces also uh, means that we learn from them and improve uh, the conditions on planet Earth, which is still the only planet to have a hopefully more or less happy life. I would now give the word to my friend Felix Gutzwiller to have a uh, commenting on your conference, and I'm sure he, he cannot wait to ask you some, some questions. Yeah. Thank you, Martin, and thank you, Professor Capua, for this excellent uh, talk. I really don't uh, want to give you my own opinion, but rather right away go into the discussion. I'm sure there are also many people out there that would like to ask questions. And I have to start off, uh, I thought about it during the talk, uh, with a question that's not uh, quite close to the medical issue, but rather to the management of the whole pandemic. And also, in view of your biography, uh, as Martin told us at the beginning, you were a member of parliament in the uh, government of Mario Monti. And one of the big discussions we had in Switzerland regarding the management of the pandemic was the role of science and the role of politics. Uh, Switzerland, there was a science task force formed um, uh, after some pushing by the scientists that they were not heard enough. And ever since, we've had a controversy on what this relationship is, how far it should go, to what extent politics should listen to science. So I think we'd be very interested to hear your comments on, on the relationship in a pandemic between science and politics. Well, thank you. Thank you for this question. And... Um, I don't think we have five and a half hours for me to answer it, but I would say that the first thing is that we cannot go on with creating a relationship and a dialogue in the middle of an emergency. I mean, this is like, it is so obvious. And what I find incredibly frustrating about um, how unprepared we were, okay, as a society, uh, and in particular, as I would say, as the political bodies, is that we knew that a pandemic was going to happen. I mean, pandemics happen, right? So how is it possible that, apart from virologists like myself that have spent most of their career advocating for one health, you know, how the interaction between human health, animal health, and environmental health. But it wasn't only us. It, um, Bill Gates, in 2015, stood up and said, the next problem is going to be a pandemic. But nobody listened. And this is, this is, is scary, if you think about it, because um, we do have some certainties in you know, in, in the scientific environment. And we did know that, that something like this was going to happen. I have to say that we were much more prepared for an influenza pandemic because we had a system that was geared up to respond much better. But still, um, very few countries were prepared. And, and, and this is sad because it's not something that came out of the blue. And so I would... I would take your question as a learning point about do we need to establish a permanent group of uh, scientists that dialogue with politicians um, much more than what we have done until now. And politicians should not, well, I mean, this is, this is one of the big problems, but short-termism is what, you know, doesn't allow us to look a little bit beyond where we are just now. Just a little bit deeper into the issue of preparedness, which you uh, also, of course, described and addressed. Uh, this was also an issue in this country, but how do you really explain the fact that you have a beautiful slide showing us a hundred years of pandemics every five to ten years, and certainly an outlook for the next five or ten years for other pandemics, and how come, particularly the Western countries, were so unprepared? Perhaps there's some difference. Some of the Asian countries were perhaps a little bit more prepared. Uh, the Asian countries had seen, had exactly. seen the dress rehearsal yeah. several times. 
and so I think that the number one uh, driver of the domino effect that was caused by not being prepared is denial. So when you might remember that in Italy we had um, two Chinese tourists who were, were, came to Italy, to Rome, they got sick, they, they, they got the severe disease, they went to hospital, they were both cured, and they went back to, to China. And at that point, um, it, you know, there wasn't everybody sitting on their chair and saying, hey, but this could be a war, I mean, this is something we need to be concerned about. There's flights that are coming all the time. And let's say that the Italians were looking at the Chinese saying, oh, but this is their problem, it's not gonna affect us. And then it came to Italy and the, the, the Central Europeans were saying, oh, but this is a problem of the Italians. And then the, the British were saying, oh, but this is a problem of Europe. And, and the Americans were saying, oh, but this is only a problem of the other side of the Atlantic, but this is a pandemic. And so the fact that there was the illusion that your country would not be vulnerable to a virus that is extremely contagious and transmissible was just like the biggest mistake that was made at the start because then it created a series of domino effects that also i think put politicians in difficult situations i mean it it's it's difficult to tell your people especially if you're not really convinced um you know we have to do a lockdown um why well because there's a problem in china right or there's a it's difficult and that's why i i think that we really need to create a more stable dialogue with stakeholders um across the board mm. I think that's a, that's a very important point. Um, probably felt also too secure for, for decades that this wouldn't happen in a global way. And of course, it's also an effect of globalization. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't have traveled so fast. You mentioned the camels, okay. They have a slower pass, as we know. And then all of a sudden it was there and uh, most countries were, were really not prepared. Uh, not only that, what we also saw is that uh, the national state uh, had a stronger impact on that, so the collaboration between states, also in Europe, didn't really properly work. And within the national states, we had uh, bureaucracies who were too slow to deal with that um, and to do the necessary measures. And what is also interesting, I mean, uh, COVID till now has uh, two, maybe even three waves. Okay, after the first wave, uh, or when the first wave came, it's understandable that we that we were uh, surprised and taken in shock and so. But I would say at least after after the uh, last summer, we 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 knew more or less that it could happen or it would happen again and could have been better pre prepared. And I, I fully support your 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 call for a common understanding of a policy um, on, on a global frame. But uh, as we know, as politicians, and so it's 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 altogether uh, difficult to to establish that. But nevertheless, we we, we have to do it. No, we have we have to follow that. And you you are a missionary. You you are the foremost diplomat of doing that. And everybody listens to you in fascination. And so you have to address everybody from from Joe Biden <laughs> to Xi Jinping. And and then maybe uh, it might help. Um, well. Uh I, I think that we have um, a very special moment now because attention towards this problem, it has never been like this. And with reference to what you were saying, um, I also think that part of the denial was linked to the fact that the uh, ordinary person, citizen, did not think that homo sapiens could not stop a medical problem because 
people don't know the difference between viruses and bacteria. And you say, well, you use an antibiotic and, and or they say, but there must be a vaccine, right? Like there must be a vaccine. Well, you know what? There wasn't a vaccine. Mm. And so they did not really perceive it as a real risk that would affect their family. And then there's the gigantic issue of communication. I mean, so it is so difficult to to make sense of the little that you know, because at the beginning of a pandemic, this is the first pandemic that we know of caused by a coronavirus. We had seen a few other, let's say, MERS and SARS, and but it was a completely different story. And so on one hand, scientists need to stick to the science, but we are also asked to make some speculations on information that we don't have. And people out there do not like uncertainty. But science is often uncertain because we, tomorrow we know more than today. And so, by definition, there's space for improvement. You made a big plea uh, for COVID also being, uh, in a way, a challenge in terms of uh, using the data that we uh, have at our disposal. And in fact, uh, as, you, as you showed, uh, COVID was possible under the conditions of globalization, but probably also shows that digitalization is one of the most important uh, features in our times. How do you um, assess this? You mentioned some of the problems you have in data, simple problems such as gender, uh, uh, separated data, but how do you look at this, this area? Who should, in fact, really monitor this on a worldwide level? Uh, do we lack some institutions? Should this be the universities? Uh, Johns Hopkins uh, counting the number of cases we have every day. Um, do we make enough out of the digital, to the digital tools that are at our disposal these days to really maximize the monitoring of uh, such a pandemic? Um, I think that we need to l look at things from another perspective, which is digitalization can be absolutely crucial to do incredible things, but it has to come from the people. So the concept of circular health is a concept in which people are empowered to... Um, to be the, the main actors of their own health. So people should be able, and we don't have this yet, we don't have it, to donate their data, knowing that their biomedical data will not be used against them and will not be sold to anyone uh, in a protected environment. Um, in the United States, when you get a driving license, you sign on the driving license if you want to donate organs. Yes? No. Why can't we do it with data? Why? Because we don't have a framework yet. And, and people are afraid. They are afraid that if they, you know, release their data, this can be manipulated. And so if, if we understand that especially in the Western world, uh, health systems cannot, uh, hold, cannot uh, let's say, um, thrive uh, because of the demographics. Okay, so we have an aging population and this is um, something that we have to account for. My generation needs to uh, push any illness um, in the future, I need to prevent. And my generation is already un understands prevention. Because if we burden, I, I like to make this example with diabetes. We are working on a circular health approach to diabetes. So if we, we could uh, study pre-diabetic people and see their uh, food, what they eat, and w record with sensors. I know there are people in here who work with sensor technology, a lot of their activities. We could probably be able to find uh, new drivers of this and push the clinical disease further. Mm. 
because we don't want people who are, let's say, uh, predisposed to diabetes to get sick at 50 if they can get it sick at 70. And this is the way that we have to think, but this can only be done if citizens understand it and contribute to it. It cannot continue to be top-down because I think that um, top-down is going to be more and more difficult, especially for the generations after mine. Mm -hmm. But this is yep. clearly the task of preventive medicine, fairly. Exactly. Yes. No? Uh, but I'd like to challenge you a little bit more uh, on the virology side. Uh, I'm sure that the audience would be very interested to hear your prognosis. Uh, how will this develop? We have now four or so mutations of concern. We have many, many, many more mutations. Uh, we have in Switzerland about 14% of the population with two, two vaccinations. Uh, as is shown, as is shown in the UK, there are many more. Uh, we have um, perhaps 20% of the population that has had some contact with the virus. Do we see uh, within this year herd immunity? Uh, if so, in what areas so don't we? Will the, the virus eval evolve even further? What's so your, this uh, is a really case? difficult question. <laughs> it um, has to be put on the yeah, table. Yeah, so it's really difficult. Uh, and I'm trying not to say something here. It doesn't make sense. Uh, it's the first time. And it's the first time that we are able to, because, because this virus has had an acceleration which was driven by the fact that it was inoculated into the population with planes flying. And so in normal terms, the virus would have moved with a camel. Had it been for the virus, okay, let's look at viruses from an evolutionary point of view. Um, a hundred years, if you look at how viruses, for example, okay, uh, measles comes from rinderpest. Okay, so it was a disease of cattle that over years and years and years infected, um, infected people and became another disease. But these mechanisms, because Homo sapiens and other animals, they don't move that fast, were actually quite slow. Look at how long the Spanish flu to to took to go around the world. So now we are, we are measuring uh, variables that we have never seen because we have never seen such massive spread in such a diverse population. We have situations in which you say, yes, but what about vaccines? And, and vaccines work. And this is a miracle because vaccines could have not worked. And so please get your vaccine. It doesn't matter which vaccine, but get your vaccine as soon as you can. Vaccines are the most important tool that we have in this moment, unless we want to continue to be locked down for the rest of our lives, to... Uh, crush the curve here. Do you think that the path of developing yeah. the vaccines was on a steady way rather quick or was it too slow or what would happen no. if we had Miracle. a lot more or less okay? No. And what, what, what people Absolutely. are also interested in is what, what, what would you say is the single most dangerous and malicious char characteristic of COVID-19? Is it... Uh, more dangerous than we still think? Is it less dangerous? Can it develop in new mutations like the Indian version, which might be becoming even more more uh, life-threatening? What's your estimate on that? My estimate is that the virus and pandemics are like uh, a, a tsunami of water, and water reaches everywhere. You cannot stop water. And it will spill over into animals as well. And uh, we don't know what is going to happen in animals. Um, we know some things that have happened. In Denmark, we've had the infection of minks. There's been some other animals. We have, I, I think, no reports of mustelids, which are minks and uh, ferrets from Asia, for example. Could it have spilled over into wild animals? Um, why not? It has happened elsewhere. So we have many, many question marks. Um, but I, I would like to say that um, with reference to what is 
you know, what lies ahead, it is very difficult to say anything also because of the global, the distribution of the population and the demography of the world population. And so, um, for example, we don't yet know what massive circulation in, in young people is like. And this is going to happen mostly in Africa and in developing countries because of the lower age range. And so there are so many variables that are out there that my, let's say, my gut feeling is that um, we, can, we, we can manage it, um, but we need to work in the same direction. And actually the fact that so many people are refusing to get vaccinated is just, um, is just really unreal unreal because um, this so when homo sapiens had a vaccine that is the only times when it was able to manage pandemics uh, all the plagues uh, the spanish flu and other ones if we didn't have a vaccine they you know they just would have spread and spread and spread so yeah yeah, if I have a completely different question, I um, might address uh, different uh, topics of, of your really fascinating talk. One Health is a really important concept. In my opinion, it's not a concept that, that is very well known, given its importance. Uh, in Switzerland, for instance, the Swiss Tropical Institute in Basel has for a long time also been uh, working in One Health issues. And you showed very nicely that, in fact, you need a circular kind of... Uh, conceptualization of the classical European faculty system, for instance. We have also a director of the University of Zurich in our audience. Um, what's your assessment on your, you know, very well worldwide institutions? How far have we gone? Uh, how far are, is the university landscape in implementing uh, this, uh, this very important concept? Uh, of One how, Health. How do you see that, uh, the future of that? So One Health, uh, I have to say that I feel a bit sorry for the concept of One Health because One Health was developed in like in the 60s and um, there were lots of reasons to, to you know, embrace One Health. And, but nobody really embraced it. It was always a Cinderella. It was all, because it was interdisciplinary, it was like, like a creature of a lesser god. And so it's always been veterinarians that have, that have, uh, that have worked and, and asked with public health people and doctors, look, we need to work together. But it never really took off. And now it took off and everybody is talking about One Health. And I feel that it is a concept that requires restyling. It requires an update because the concept of One Health is about the overlap between health of humans, animals, and the environment. And by the way, plants are considered part of the environment, but if we consider that we need to feed 10 billion people soon, and 80% of their diet is made of plants, I think that plants maybe should be in the bigger picture. But what what happens is, what, what I see is a limitation to the, let's say, 1960s, 19s, up to year 2000 of One Health, is that it was very focused on um, zoonotic diseases, the human-animal interface, then food, then AMR, but it was only mostly about the human-animal and a little bit environmental link. With COVID, this has exploded. And One Health, every day we discover a new interconnection, a new interconnection between uh, mobility and mental health uh, and, uh, and the use of, and the consumption of drugs. Every day we learn a new interface between health and what lies outside. And so I think that it is a great opportunity for One Health to grow to One Health to, to transform itself. And universities have, I think, uh, I, uh, an important responsibility in helping uh, students understand that um, 
things are much more complex than the pandemic is showing us the complexity of of of, of our actions, of our behavior, of all of our vulnerability. And so I am hoping that more and more, I would say, empowered One Health. I like to call it circular health because we have a circular agriculture, we have circular economy, and we don't have circular health. Not yet, but why we are working on that. And so yeah. I like to imagine a broader approach, which I, I like to call circular. I think it's a long learning process and uh, of course, universities have to promote it, but also politicians, and it has to be somehow founded in the consciousness of, of society. Otherwise, it does not work, and there are still differences between, uh, let's say, the Western world and uh, countries like Africa and so where It's much more difficult to implant that. Uh, what would interest me, how is this concept uh, accepted or, or received in the United States where, where, where you work and where uh, Florida University has its own center on that. I, I would say also the conditions, uh, speaking of the government, are now again more uh, favorable than uh, a couple of months before. Or, uh, am I wrong on that? No, absolutely. Um, uh, the uh, University of Florida has what is called a comprehensive campus. So it has veterinary medicine, medicine, agriculture and public health. And this is, is a, a, a very big resource. And my center is an interdisciplinary center that tries not to make these necessarily these groups work together because they should be working together, but it actually tries to bring in other disciplines to facilitate and to explore new areas at the interface between medicine and public health. Um, there are so many drivers of health. Just think of religion. Um, I, we have a group uh, of scientists that is working with us who have worked in Ethiopia, and in Ethiopia, uh, one of the beliefs about COVID is that it is a curse from God. And, uh, and, uh, and, yeah. and of course, how can you manage something on a global level with these different perspectives? If it's a curse from God, why do you want a vaccine for it, right? Absolutely. So, so we really need to, to understand um, the multiple interconnections that are not only about our bodies, they are about our behaviors, they are about the way we think, they are about um, our economies, they are about multiple situations that um, we, we experience. Absolutely. Um, at the end of your conference, you mentioned, of course, also the how you call that a chapter on sex and gender. Could you tell us a little bit more about that, that we even have an even better understanding of, of what is requested also from, uh, from uh, mature white men, for instance, like the two of us. Mm -hmm. So what can we do to improve that too? I mean, uh, uh, men go to war, make war, and, and, and women heal. We know that for, for, I don't know, since the beginning of mankind. And uh, women are always the, the center of gravity, also especially in Italy, but even in Switzerland more and more. That's good. That's all wonderful. So, but how how do you see this this development and this um, this uh, also diversity between the the sexes and so who is responsible for what? Well, we can't pretend that we can bunch people together. If we, if we look at data and they are subdivided by age groups, I mean, would it make sense to look at COVID data without a, a subdivided by age? Exactly. So already getting data from public institutions, which is a disaggregated by sex, it doesn't happen all the time. You have to ask for it. And it, it wasn't built in the system. You will know that when at the beginning, when we were uh, looking at the data, uh, at the early data was not uh, disaggregated by sex at all. However, to do research on, on data, and particularly in the social sciences, um, you buy data 
from companies that have the mobility data, uh, which is cleaned up, the an, you know, anonymized and all the rest, and you look at it to see, you know, let's uh, consider if we can substitute buses uh, with bicycles. You know, how do you do it? You need the mobility data. <laughs> you need to understand the dynamics of movement. And I think, and, and many of us think, we have a group, and actually we're trying to push this towards um, in, uh, with Women20, which is the engagement group of the G20, which is in Italy um, this year. Um, why should it not be available by default? Why? I mean, how, like, when you collect this data, you, you do have the information of whether it's males or females. And I think it would greatly benefit both males and females if we could really understand the differences better. Because, you know, if you take it as one population, it, the population moves in different ways, also linked to being a woman or, or, or not. And so I just think that we need to be brave. We need to be brave. I mean, the, the pandemic has disrupted our lives. It has disrupted our economies. It, it has created enormous gaps, knowledge gaps in our students, in our students at university, at, at school, because they, they suddenly had to go and you know, learn things and, and do things in a different way. So we have to take advantage of this and do what we can to be in a different place in the after the pandemic. I would like to hear that in 20 years we will say, oh, yeah, we, we, we didn't do uh, sex disaggregated data uh, for before the pandemic, now we do. Felix, you agree? <laughs> yes, uh, 100%, but I would just add, but in many quarters, I think in all scientific studies, it's standard today that you use sociodemographic uh, criteria, not only, uh, not only gender, but also social status, you showed very clearly. And the data is accumulating also in uh, Western Europe and United States that this is once more a disease also of uh, inequality. And uh, if you see 1% vaccinated in Africa, uh, 30% or 50% in UK, USA, etc. you see that uh, this is really one of the challenging issues. So sociodemographic data are really, uh, I would say, uh, standard and uh, totally agree that uh, you cannot follow this pandemic without a clear data strategy. Uh, and we need to do it at a global level. So, you know, we, we need to, one thing is Europe, one thing is the United States, and one thing is the rest of the world. And I think that it is time that, you know, mm. we, we look at these things. But uh, um, I think, I mean, okay, absolutely wonderful, but data are only a means to a certain goal. Mm. So, and maybe the moral or the morals of the thing is also, uh, when we are learning about the pandemic, that uh, society has to improve its patterns to be better prepared maybe also between the sexes, or is this too far-fetched now? Um, well, I think that, um, for example, uh, if we had protected the elderly um, at the very start, and we had explained to the elderly that they were the most vulnerable, we wouldn't have... Of, of, had such a severe situation in certain places. And so in the same way that we feel authorized or we could have felt authorized to tell elderly people don't go out, if women are less uh, susceptible of developing the severe form, especially in, at a certain age range, maybe we could have left them you know, to work three days a week instead of being fired. Mm. Right, so there are measures that we can study and we can develop that are based on how the virus behaves, which is not really the virus's fault. It's the it's which which actually is about more about the host yeah. than about the virus. Yeah, but but again, I would say uh, <clears throat> this belongs to a whole series of socio-democratic criteria, uh, as you've shown briefly. I mean. 
COVID has pushed back millions of people into poverty, men and women, particularly in the developing countries. And we have lost a gain of about 10 years of uh, positive developments in, in earnings and income in developing countries due to COVID. So uh, we, again, we have to have a holistic approach. We have to look at uh, the gender issue, but also at social and other, uh, uh, other components, if you really want to uh, come up with a reasonable strategy. Martin, if you allow me to, can I be just a little bit uh, <coughs> obnoxious and ask you again about herd immunity? You didn't address, address this. If, you, if I would force you okay. to make a prognosis, when do we in our populations reach herd immunity? Still in 21 or 22 or in view of uh, Africa and other continents? Never. What, what would you say? Excuse me I mean, if I... I'm no, no, a fair enough. It's a very important question also yeah, in Switzerland. Yeah, so... I think that herd immunity is is um, is not round the corner, but we we can be content with a herd immunity or a, a level of a or a, a sensible barrier of protection in the categories that are more at risk. And so I think that we, I mean, how can we, we cannot vaccinate, right, everyone. We can only vaccinate. We are at one billion, more or less. The vac dose number one billion has been uh, administered, but it's a long way to get to the, to the end of the queue. And so, um, of course, lockdown measures uh, reduce viral circulation. And so it's a balance between what you're trying to prevent and... Uh, and getting the virus to circulate, uh, I am unsure whether it will, unless kids, unless they get vaccinated. So if the young people get vaccinated, then it's another story. But if they don't, I'm afraid that what will happen is there will be, um, if the if the elderly population and the vulnerable population is vaccinated, um, there will maybe be some outbreaks or some clusters in some areas where the immunity goes down for whatever reason, which is brought by, of course, by the virus that is circulating in other levels of population. I think it'll be a while before we we can get rid of the, we can get rid of the viral infection, which then causes a series of other problems. Viruses behave as viruses, and it's people who create pandemics. And they are not nice, uh, I cannot say people, they are not nice entities, as we know, of course, yeah, they are really difficult to handle. So, there is a lot of questions, and um, I'm sure we cannot cover all, and um, we have to find also, if possible, short answers to that. Yeah, I don't do short answers. Uh, <laughs> I'm we sorry. <laughs> we, 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 we love your long answers, absolutely. That's no question. But I don't. we also have to respect that so many people are curious to, to hear your answer on their very important uh, questions. And there are some really good ones um, like this. Is it time to move from private-owned pharmaceutical companies to state-owned regulated pharmaceutical research and production? It's, of course, against all liberal consciousness, but maybe you have another answer. Okay, so there's different levels here, and uh, I can answer it from another angle, which is the angle of data sharing. So we know that sharing data for biomedical on experiments or on your research is difficult because you want to publish and you need to you know, do your career. But uh, data sharing, for example, gen sequence sharing of viruses is extremely important. And it, sequence sharing, which I have close to my heart, um, was uh, virtually nowhere in 2006 when we had bird flu. And when I proposed this idea of sharing the, vir the sequences of the viruses that were isolated from animals and from humans and from in different geographical parts, and they should all be pooled. I was told that this was imp impossible. Today, 15 years later, we have databases that contain 1.5 million sequences. Fif this is in 15 years. It's not like 100 years ago. 
So in the case of pandemic preparedness, we need to work together. We need to have systems that speak to each other in the United States, in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, in Australia, that actually are prepared, have a preparedness network to react immediately to pandemic emergencies. So does this mean that pharma should become private, should become public, public. and I don't, or vaccine production? I don't think so, but I do think that we need to find better partnerships, which may also be nonprofit. In case of an emergency, I mean, does it really make sense that we have had millions of deaths that we could have prevented if there had been, a, you know, a pan-coronavirus vaccine that was ready? Because it's not that we haven't been working on these. When SARS emerged and when MERS emerged, scientists wanted to make pre-pandemic vaccines, but then they weren't funded. Okay. Another question somehow connected to the first one. Should affordable health care be treated as a human right? Well, What? that's a, well, that's so I live in the United States and, and uh, you know, the richest country of the world does not have affordable health care. So it's uh, it is something which is a matter of discussion, but that finds opposition not only in, in you know, uh, also in countries that are very well developed. So um, maybe uh, basic access to certain uh, levels of health care, because, of course, I mean, it's, it's a long way to <laughs> provide um, accessible health care, you know, everywhere where we have, you know, outbreaks of cholera that are going on, right? There's cholera still. Absolutely. So... So there's a lot to do about that too. Well, this also um, refers to your past in Parliament. Do you think more scientists should run for political office or should they play a more advisory role rather than in the center of driving public opinion? Hmm. Well, you can reconsider your past. Um, so... Um, the, 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 my experience in, in the political environment was a real shock uh, because it is a system that works according to certain rules that are not written but that are clear to the people who are there and have been there for a while. And actually, um, people like myself were not really empowered to do anything because the machine is so complicated, plus you, like you work with, ah, you're a scientist, ah, <laughs> you're a scientist. And so um, I, I am unsure whether scientists should be politicians, but I am certain that we need more scientific advisors, and I am certain that uh, science cannot be uh, communicated or divulged the way it has been, but it needs to be woven into public conscience. Because if not, um, you know, we will not be prepared for whatever is coming next. Uh, which is not only necessarily a pandemic, there are other ugly things that could happen. And so, um, I don't really know the word, the word in English, but in Italian it's alfabetizzazione scientifica. We need to improve the basic level of knowledge of science in the population, because if not, they will not be able to. And that is something that people like myself uh, should, should do, because um, uh, e communicating certain things requires experience and and requires being able to speak a common language and that you learn in politics i should also address the questions to felix you have to answer it too yeah it will be a long story but uh, <laughs> <laughs> i certainly agree with the last point uh, i think the one needs a big effort to uh, you know 
for some scientific literacy is perhaps the uh, English translation. Uh, and many people in this world, in the complexity of this world, uh, seek resource in any kind of uh, theories, uh, particularly now if you look at vaccinations, all sort of uh, strange theories to uh, somehow cope with the complexity of the world. And uh, this can't be only counteracted with some uh, scientific literacy. I personally think, yes, we should, we should have some more science also in Parliament. If you look, I don't want to, to get polemic, but in Switzerland you have about 35 to 40 representatives of agriculture, important part of your whole system. And you have right now about two people that know from inside how a university really functions. And uh, everyone talks about the scientific society of tomorrow. Uh, no, we are not in a scientific culture uh, in politics at all, and therefore I personally would certainly welcome if yes, one or the other scientist would, uh, would yeah. come for Parliament. Room for improvement. In Orson Welles' 1949 film The Third Man, we saw the critical role that organized crime played in the illegal trafficking of medication. Can you comment on the role of organized crime in jeopardizing your vision? Should we be concerned? I really don't know enough about organized crime to make any... I, I just don't know enough. However, there is one thing that I would like to underline, and which is the weaponization of viruses. So, um, and, and I'm going to say this right. Um, the WHO sent uh, a mission to China to establish whether the COVID-19 was generated in the lab. Now, um, the mission uh, came up with a conclusion that this was uh, not likely at all. However, I would like to say that if the WHO believes that there was the need to establish whether this was the case, it means that laboratories, not only in China, in other parts of the world as well, are able of perf performing experiments that can manipulate viruses and make them more dangerous, okay? Because if they didn't think this was real, they would have not sent a mission to see what was happening. Mm. While virologists understand the reasons of uh, generating these manipulated viruses and some of the reasons are good some of the reasons I personally don't agree with but that's another story people don't understand this and they we need to absolutely be um, uh, aware that we must regulate these types of experiments and this cannot be a debate which only remains inside the biomedical community. The reason for this is that exactly f f with the same uh, comparison about sequence sharing that 15 years ago it took one week to generate one sequence and now we have 1.5 million. If we continue to get good at creating these viruses in the laboratory, it will be many laboratories around the world. And nowadays, it is very difficult to tell a country, do not perform these experiments because only my country can do this. And so this is an enormous problem, which is about gain of function experiments, which must absolutely be addressed. Because if we don't, and we don't, suit, and we don't do it in, in successfully, the people will lose even more trust in scientists, and we cannot afford it. There's a question connected to this. What about the denial right at the origin by the Chinese government um, up to this very day? Isn't this most telling about the underlying problem? Um, I, I think that I, I would like, I don't know about the denial now because I really struggle to get a grasp of what is happening. China is a big place and so I, I, I honestly, I don't have it particularly clear. 
But at the beginning, most of you probably don't remember that when SARS emerged, there was a team of virologists who went to Hong Kong and they announced that they had isolated the virus and they made a mistake. They said it was a paramyxovirus and it was a coronavirus. And so this is something that we cannot afford. And so I think that before the Chinese authority uh, made available the information they had, it took some time, which I am unable to say whether is physiological or was extended for whatever reason. But when you are faced with a virus that you, that, that you didn't know about, you don't have any tests. Mm. You, have to, you have to develop diagnostic tests to understand what it is. And you have to also make sure that that is a primary pathogen because coronaviruses are also pathogens of the common cold. And so uh, with the emergency that was happening, I think that there was a delay which was caused by the fact that there was no space for making mistakes and that they needed to be certain. So I can, I can say this, um, perhaps um, what was particularly slow was once they had realized how contagious it was, maybe the lockdown should have been uh, stronger, should have been more uh, extended also because we, we know that the, um, just before the virus emerged, there was, uh, no, actually, at the very early start of, of the epidemic, there was um, the Chinese, new, uh, Chinese uh, New Year. And that determined lots of people that traveled across China. And so at that point, it was more or less clear that infection would have become widespread. But uh, at least the lockdown there was very rigid and very effective. No, we have to admit that. Now, that's another question also because probably you mentioned uh, animals and uh, pet animals. I'm a dog owner myself, so I uh, cherish this question. How shall we interact in the future with our pets that might be susceptible for corona-like viruses and transmit them to us? Hmm. Um, so, um, I would like to say that there are some hygienic measures that are to be uh, respected, whether it's a coronavirus or not. There are other diseases and ugly things that can be transmitted from pets. We've had, we have them, we know what it is, and I think that um, actually the potential spillover of of SARS-CoV-2 into a series of animal populations is something that we should look at very closely because we could um, maybe uh, observe the development of other lineages of the virus that could then, you know, return to the human host and maybe be very different. So um, looking at the space between, at the human-animal interface, I think is, and, and particularly also with wild animals, because domestic animals can then transmit it also to wild animals. So referring to the pets, wash your hands and wash your pets. But this is regardless of COVID. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's always a good advice. Agreed? So the last two. <laughs> Does the pandemic remind us that we are not made for 120 years of life? Yes. Is it true, though? Are we not made? Um, I, I, I don't know. However, I think that the pension system would go bankrupt. And so there's like no discussion. Depends <laughs> because on the... if I live until I'm 120, my daughter lives until she's... When I'm 120, she's going to be 90. Wonderful. Yes. Have a big party in the family. So and I don't know. However, the it depends, fragility. Of it also depends on the pens, uh, pens, pension systems of different countries, of course. But uh, as, as we saw now, and uh, I mean, sorry, in the Middle Ages, they, were, they died with 20 or so. They were married with 12. And that was it. And so they believed in God and the eternal life. And then they had a new future. But in our skeptical times, it's a little bit... Uh, 
uh, different. So um, the last question. Does it make more sense to continue with the vaccinations to include even the youngest in the first world countries or should efforts rather be switched to populations in the developing countries? Hmm, schwierig. I'm not Bill Gates, so uh, wh whatever I say doesn't, <laughs> I would not, uh, let's say, change anything. I, I think that there's been a lot of discussion about uh, vaccinating, you know, the developing countries, with, to which you have to ship the vaccine and you have to make sure that they get the vaccine and so on. Um, I am uh, unsure on whether the numbers would match because vaccinating developing countries means developing, vaccinating many, many people. And I don't think we have the doses now. However, I do think that we should start really thinking about how we can be more equitable because uh, when I mention systems that collapse, um, this is what we really need to fear. And I'm sure that a lot of you are aware of the ramifications of, of this explosion of COVID in India, even on vaccine production and on the production of medicines that are made in that part of the world. And so we are also greatly interconnected, um, f you know, for commercial reasons. And uh, yeah, uh, it's a very difficult balance. Um, and I think that, uh, yeah, we should, we should really see how we can make a change because it, it, so how we can do something impactful because if you look at the numbers of people that are vaccinated in very populous countries it's like a nothing mm. in india and china it's like nothing it's like less than one percent yeah. and so even maybe if you take all the doses that would go to teenagers it would still be a nothing and so we need to do proportionate evaluations of the advantages and disadvantages so I... If I just can add one, uh, one sentence, I still think we have to make a global effort because the problem is unless we vaccinate also the developing countries, we will not uh, get rid of future mut mutations. We will not have a world where half of the world is in herd immunity and the other world is not at all. So if you don't get the 1% vaccinated in Africa up to more, uh, will be dangerous also for us because the mutations will co continue to develop. They will come also in the Western vaccinated world. And there is a little bit of hope. There are international efforts such as COVAX. There are now vaccines coming up that don't need any more a cold chain, as you uh, uh, alluded to. So I'm uh, a little bit uh, optimistic that not this year, but 22, 23, we'll see oh, yeah. billions and billions of oh, doses also oh, in yeah. the developing world. No, I thought you meant now. And I think, and the whole, you know, the whole reasoning behind thermal stable vaccines is exactly what you say. We do need to get the world population immunized, whether by taking a certain number of doses from a certain population that maybe wants it and needs it is going to make that difference. I don't, I'm unsure. I think that if we had vaccines that didn't need freezers and didn't need to be transported at those temperatures, we would certainly be reaching many more people with a vaccine that is, let's say, working, because if vaccines are not treated properly, they lose power. And, and that's another problem in itself. And that's a great challenge you mentioned. Absolutely. It's very interesting. No, thank you very much. We have another 60 questions. Um, very good. So questions. we're staying here all night. Um, more or less, okay. but I have another solution for that. <laughs> um, we invite you again. Yes. Soon. Yes. And hopefully without this. And we go analog again at Zurich University. And I'm sure we'll have thousands of people watching and listening to your wonderful ideas and visions, also uh, perceptions. And um, thank you very, very much. Uh, that is uh, and was a great uh, experience. We worked very hard to get you here. It took us about, I don't know, more than a year. Yes. But that oh, it yeah. worked out finally and uh, in real presence, not just on... I'm here. It's uh, true. Yeah, I'm it's here really true. It's no fake. It's true. 
uh, that is absolutely wonderful and uh, thank you so much. I would like to address our audience shortly in German. Uh, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, sehr herzlichen Dank, dass Sie uns weiterhin so aufmerksam und zahlreich ähm, begleiten und äh, auch äh, den Livestream verfolgen. Das freut uns außerordentlich. Wir sind schon äh, mitten in den Vorbereitungen für das Herbstsemester natürlich, hoffentlich dann eben auch wieder analog, aber analog immer auch plus Livestream. Wir haben noch neue Formate entwickelt, von denen Sie eins schon gehört haben äh, letzte Woche. Äh, wir haben interessante Gäste auf der Liste zugesagt, haben schon ein Applebaum, äh, Christian Lindner und Neil Ferguson. Und so geht es dann hoffentlich auch noch weiter. Wir wünschen Ihnen gute Gesundheit nach wie vor. Für diejenigen, die noch nicht geimpft sind, eine möglichst effiziente Impfung. Und dann einen schönen Sommer mit guter Erholung, dass wir alle wieder frisch und munter beieinander sind und über die großen und auch manchmal die nicht so großen Probleme der Welt diskutieren können. We thank uh, Ilaria Capua and Felix Gutzwiller again for their presence and their lively discussion. Thank you so much. Good night. <lacht>